Hello, everyone. I'm Jason Cohen, the author of An Introduction to the Art and Science of Chinese Tea Ceremony. Today, we're discussing Book 2, Chapter 6, Section 2, Developmental History of Yixing Mining. Here to talk about this chapter is our editorial team, Patrick Penny. Hey, hey. And Zong Jun Li. Hello, hello. Hello, Pat. Hello, Zong Jun. Zong Jun, starting with you, much of the early research for this chapter revolved around drawing an accurate map. Why were there so few existing accurate maps of the mining locations in Yixing? And what did it take to draw up an up-to-date accurate map? The resources about the map of different layers and different mining locations are very scattered uh, among the internet and various you know, text resources that we have been referenced with. And frequently, you you would find you know um, contradicting information about uh, exact location of a certain mining site or uh, certain uh, mine layers or what certain mine ores or mine layers being called. So it took us a lot of time to kind of cross reference different uh, materials to make sure that you know we are landing on the right information and uh, we're using the most up-to-date terms to describe the mining site, the ores, the mine layers, and so on and so forth. And also, it takes a lot of time to design um, the patterns and the colors of the grams to, to reference correctly on you know, different types of um, clay in different layers. So it has been fun. Um, it's a fun journey to, to finally, you know, finish off a, uh, we think is the, uh, the most accurate version so far <laughs> of all the mine layers in Yixing region. Starting, you know, writing and researching for this book, did you think you were going to become a, uh, a map maker or much of a digital artist? <laughs> I certainly find my uh, artistic passion along the way. Um, <laughs> and I also learned a great deal about, you know, mining and uh, geologic uh, formations <laughs> and all the other unnecessary information <laughs> related to tea. Well, the scope of the topic has certainly uh, expanded slightly uncontrollably as this book has undergone uh, publication um, from its initial. Its initial scope was relatively small. Like, these are Yixing teapots. This is how you use Yixing teapots. And now the scope, we're 500 pages later, less than halfway through the book. Oh, that, that's the <laughs> we, we surpassed 500 pages today. Woo! Um, uh, Woo! Less than a third of the way through the book. So this, this has turned into a tome. But Pat, same question, slightly modification on the same question to you. Uh, given that this is likely the first time that you've seen accurate maps and accurate mine diagrams of Yixing, uh, what, what has been surprising? What have you learned? I think just how close all the um, famous, uh, whether they be original or, you know, some of the later, um, sometimes earlier, right, mid-Ming and sometimes later Qing uh, mines, which were then, of course, called the original mines, just seeing how, how close all those are in relation to each other. Um, I think my mental model uh, of the mines of Yixing had a lot of these mining regions spread out much further. Uh, and I think I also, because all of these were called, you know, Shan Mountain of some sort, which you, you talk about in this chapter, I imagined literal mountain ranges. And so in my head, all of these different famous mountain ranges, like a Qinglong Shan, right, or a Huanglong Shan, were distinctly far away enough, right, to be different mountain ranges, and, and, and mountain ranges is not what they are. Uh, so I, there was a lot of learning and unpacking just, just in seeing the map and having the understanding that, uh, you know, the terminology Shan didn't refer to an actual mountain. Just that alone taught me a lot. Just want to weigh in on that because a lot of people nowadays find it super confusing about the name of the location sites. But the landscape of Yixing changed quite a bit in the past few decades. Um, you have, you know, what is formerly to be a shan or mountain. Nowadays, it's like a recreational plaza covered with c concrete uh, or new buildings, you know, uh, even high risers uh, in the city center are now emerging from what used to be a mining site. So it's quite difficult to, you know, really pinpoint the correct location or, you know, the range of the correct location referencing a modern map. I was, I was going to echo that, you know, the, the 
land of Yixing has been so terraformed on top of already being an exaggeration, you know, mountains that Huang Wang Shan's uh, some far off distant peak and you climb to the top and take the ore off the top, uh, right? And then you can look across the vast vista filled with clouds and see Qing Wang Shan. But actually, they're pretty, it's a small hill and they're like just on the other side of each other. You could take a you could take a <laughs> scroll from from one to the other and be well below cloud level. You're telling me that uh, Baoshan is not uh, obscuring your view when you're looking from one to the other. Baoshan is <laughs> not so huge that you uh, you can't see over that one. <laughs> yeah, so I think I think that that that's interesting. Both both that they started off relatively small and with exaggerated names. But also people don't realize they look at the sites now and they look at the size now, right? And they say, well, this is this is how it's always been, uh, but it hasn't, right? It's been a couple hundred years of terraformation and mining. What are open pit mines and why were they abandoned in favor of shaft mines? Well, open pit mines are, are usually what we call the early days mine, you know, it's uh, where you know people can easily find ores on the surface level of the mining site. Uh, which required uh, little to none techniques to mine those ores. Um, so we've been seeing open pit mines since as early as Ming Dynasty. And uh, till nowadays, a lot of these mines are deprived due to decade-long mining from various parties, like the, uh, the government mining, the, uh, the government miners, and the, uh, the civil miners. And that's when the shaft mines start to come about. It's when uh, people start to dig in uh, inclined tunnels into the you know mountainside or the uh, the mine layers um, and to try to you know extract deep down buried mine ores in certain regions, uh, which required uh, you know far more sophisticated technique to be able to uh, you know successfully mine those ores and sustain those shafts uh, along the way. Yeah, and the shift seemed to be a matter of necessity. You, you write as much in the book that, you know, the open pit mines and the half sloping mines uh, are, are heavily affected by uh, rain and I'm sure other, you know, environmental factors strongly affected them. I can guess that flooding was a big issue. Mentally picturing how these mines worked was, was a little difficult for me. And I think uh, as we were going through the editing process, I had said as much. And so um, this chapter also includes some diagrams so that readers can understand exactly what some of the differences between an open pit, uh, half slope, or shaft mine um, really look like. And I think Zongjun, that was your art once again. But you know, as as time and technology increased, we needed a way to reach deeper and deeper veins of ore, uh, and that's that's where this transformation between open pit mines and shaft mines came in. With the advent of shaft mines, was the goal of mining always to dig deeper? I don't think it necessarily had to be to dig deeper. I think it probably was just to continue to find ore that was workable or seemed valuable. Um, and if that ore was deeper, then I'm sure they would go deeper. But I think they would, as as they're digging this inclined shaft, they would hit pockets, assumably, of ore. And uh, when they found those that the miners or craftsmen knew to be valuable, I'm sure they would kind of go through and use up as much of the material they could find in that in that vein as possible before moving on. Uh, so I think it probably had more to do with what they were finding versus just continuing to go deeper and deeper. Yeah, also frequently when people dig into a certain depth, they will find out the certain ores that they're looking for are no longer there. And thus, you know, came to a conclusion of the mining of that particular site. So, you know, as we've been seeing, there are, you know, uh, variations of depth across different shafts in different mining sites. Frequently, the shafts are closed because, you know, the certain ore that they're looking for are deprived. One, one thing that I'll also mention here, this is mentioned in the chapter, is that uh, many of the mines are built in a zigzag pattern, a zigzag pattern both up and down. So mine goes deep and then comes back up and then goes uh, down again, uh, and also side to side. So if you wanted to follow a vein, you could build your shaft in a, in a Z form, in a Z pattern, mm -hmm. in, in three dimensions. Usually we think of the shaft lines, we think of them just straight down, um, but that's not the way that the ore frequently settled and it's not the way the mines were usually built. And I assume at some Correct. point as you go further and further down, there you just hit a point where there's no longer any ore of interest. Uh, I assume like, you know, if we're thinking probably the the deeper, right, Johnny mines, at some level you just hit mostly all Johnny, right? And as you go further, you're just finding more and more Johnny, which we don't necessarily want for T-ware construction. That, that's exactly right. I mean, if you think that the Zisha ore is uh, alluvial secondary 
deposited clay, the right that forms stratiform lenses, um, then at some point you get below the level of the uh, depositions of the various level layers of deposition. So you could actually hit the uh, pre uh, pre depository material in Yixing. Before you do so, normally you hit Jiani, uh, and then eventually you'd hit. Uh, I'll put this in quotes, quote unquote, bedrock not consistently rock and all, consistently one material, um, but that predates the Holocene deposition. Returning to our questions on the surprisingly small area uh, that the Yixing mines fall into, there is surprisingly little variation in the, lo in the location of the historical pit mines uh, and the later shaft mines, as the shaft mines were frequently built into the pit mines. Uh, why was this a viable strategy versus digging mines in new regions? Why are the mines so clustered together? I, I assume when we think back to, let's say, the, the mid-Ming and then the transition maybe in the Qing to shaft mines, partially the condensed nature of where the mines were, I would think, has to do with where they're finding materials. So I wouldn't think that they never tried any other, you know, pit mines, or I would think that, you know, at some point they tested other sites to see if they could find ore that was valuable and probably didn't find that ore, right? And so there was a concentration of sites and areas where they found that ore. Um, but secondly, I would think that a lot of these sites, um, the, the last part of the name is village. I would think that a lot of these sites just happened to be around the areas where you had population. And so you had people who could work the mine. And if you had to travel long distances to do this mining, right, um, if it was in an area where, yes, you have ore, but um, you don't have the manpower, then uh, it's, it's going to be pretty difficult to get the amount of ore that you want without the, uh, you know, human labor needed for it. So that that's kind of my guess about why they're so condensed in this small area. Yeah, I, I would say that's a good assessment. And I want to uh, just weigh in on Pat's point that uh, they did once try to expand mining into other regions. For example, other than the Benshan region, uh, you know, Hong, Hongwei village and the two, you know, Huanglongshan, Qinglongshan. Uh, later on, people did try to go to regions like Fudong and try to at least look for, you know, uh, similar types of clay. But uh, what they end up finding is um, other associate clays like Xiaohongni and uh, Tugu. But you know they they didn't have the um, the the fortune to find similar quality clay compared to Benshan. But we know that there is similar quality clay in areas like Jiangpo, uh, where they were digging up the the road, and in, and in other areas where the mines were expanded much later. So we do know that other clay is there, but the historical mines remain clustered. Do you have yeah, so why that was? I have a partial theory. And I think the partial the, the partial theory, which obviously doesn't explain all of it, I, I, Zongjun is correct that, that there were there was some mining in other regions. The quality was variable. Sometimes they found things that were good. Sometimes they didn't. Um, and there was very little expansion of the mines. But that could be a, a factor of uh, labor supply. It could be a factor that Yixing went through boom and bust cycles of, of desirability. That mining became more or less profitable depending on the demand for co-products uh, like Nuni and, and, and Gianni clay. But I think one of the reasons that really kept a lot of the mining tightly grouped is the mimetic desire for similar clays uh, or clays of exceedingly high quality from examples that people had already seen. So someone sees a, a Zuni clay and they think to themselves, oh, this, this beautiful uh, purple brown uh, is the type of, of clay that all the, the other tea people are using. I, I want something that matches that. And then, you know, later they see clays that are, that are um, bright red and they say, I want this Juni clay, I want this Hongi clay. And so very, uh, very a mimetic set of desire from the types of collectors that were funding the purchase of tea wares that led to the mining. And so by keeping it in that small area, you were finding similar clays that were already valued. And that, I don't think that explains all of it, but I think that explains a lot of it. I will also argue that the resources of, you know, all the clays that people are looking for are far from deprived. Before the closure of all the shaft mines and, you know, open mining of Yixing wares in Yixing village, the detected uh, storage of Yixing clays are far from deprived. It's more of an environmental consideration that the government ordered the shutdown of all the uh, mining activities. 
So there are probably you know little reason for people to even start to think about venture out into other regions to find new place at that time. That perfectly brings me to my next question, which is, is there more Zisha ore available outside of these historic mining regions? And why isn't more of it retrieved or mined? Um, particularly now that the historical regions are closed. Is there other environmental protections that are in place? Is there a lack of desire? Is there a lack of demand? Lack of quality? What's the reason that we don't see new mines in new areas beyond the, the, the government mandate in the historical areas? I would say my first guess would be before the closure of the, all the mining sites, um, you still have a lot of local miners or Yixing artists uh, holding a giant piles of storage of Yixin clay from the previous era. And those storage are, you know, still great enough to sustain production of Yixin to nowadays. So probably there won't be enough momentum for people to start, you know, looking for new mines or reopen mines in other regions as for now. But uh, I'm not sure if there are any ongoing activities um, in other regions uh, for other particular reasons. And I think it partially goes to what you had uh, just talked about, Jason, where sure, I believe they could go out and do some test excavations and find clay of similar quality, uh, you know, somewhere still within Jiangsu, right? But when I think about, you know, the type of people that I, are teaware collectors and tea, you know, enthusiasts, um, I'm sure this kind of label of Jiangsu clay, but not Yixing Zusha, right, would, would become kind of a a label and a, a meta factor towards kind of analyzing the quality of this clay. And while it could be from a compositional standpoint uh, and from a quality standpoint, almost the same, um, people would think about it like they think of border tea for Puar, right? Where maybe you can find really great border tea, but oh, it's a border tea. So it's not valued the same way. Uh, and I could definitely see that happening here with outside the Benchan region, Yishin clay. That, that seems likely. Yeah, and also you cannot ignore the existence of the fakes. You know, nowadays with modern techniques, it's far easier for people to use additives or you know colorations, mineral colorations to blend clays that look very much like Yixing. At least for general consumer, it's very hard for them to tell the part from a fake one versus a genuine Yixing. You mean this pistachio green clay isn't loony? <laughs> it's a loony LTO. We had a rule in when I was living in uh, Italy in Florence with my friends. We said you can't go into any gelato shop where the the, gelato, the green pistachio gelato, which is a very popular flavor, where it glows. We called it the nuclear green uh, gelato, and the idea was that any gelato shop where the pistachio gelato is bright neon green is using artificial flavors and some artificial colorings. Whereas if you go into a gelato shop and they either they don't have pistachio because it's a pain to make uh, or if it's a a you know a gray brown color it means they're using real pistachio now that, that was our rule i think a similar rule can be applied to the yuxing tea pods yeah, and yeah, even the when you, color yeah. is a direct reference <laughs> i'm sorry pat you're all good. I'm just saying that that rule applies to many things in the tea world on chi you know yuxing teapots uh, i'm sure we can find many other things if it glows, don't buy it. Don't, don't buy it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask the opposite question now, which is, despite the mines being clustered into such a small area, one of the later chapters gets into a detailed discussion of all of the variations of all of the types of ore that are found in, in each category. So you have uh, zinni ore, and then you have subtypes of zinni, and then you have variations on the subtypes of zinni. Um, but if the area is so small, if the mines are so clustered together, is that regional variation, is that variation found within the ores legitimate? And if so, what's the cause of that variation? Well, just thinking about how the naming system for a lot of these was likely developed, and I'm sure Zongjun can chime in more, I think a lot of the difference, let's just stick with Zuni between, you know, something like a Qing Chuenyi and a Di Caoqing and Tian Qingni, 
likely comes from the observable differences in the ore when miners were mining it and then, you know, craftsmen were assigning, right, in, in the work that we've discussed in previous chapters uh, with literati. I'm sure a lot of this terminology came about from originally very observable differences. And it is very likely that from a compositional standpoint, when we think about, um, as we've discussed in previous chapters, the layers that these ores sit within, while these could all be categorized as a type of zuni and different subcategories, uh, you could have one sitting below, for example, the yellow stone layer, which material below would have some filtration that happened through that yellow stone layer that Zuni potentially above would not have seen. So there could be material differences between these different uh, subcategories, right, within a single category like Zuni. Um, but maybe Zongjin, you can elucidate it a little bit more. And also we see a lot of these variations across different types of clays too. Like for example, you see frequently see Huani being paragenesis to Hongni and Zini or Hongni and Luni. And being adjacent to other types of clay will have also, you know, more or less impact on the mezzanine clay itself. So it's a very interesting interaction to observe when we, you know, see how different layers, different types of layer or different um, you know, subcategories of layers stacking upon each other. So you're thinking, you're promoting the idea that it's not just, uh, oh, here is a layer of clay, and this is a perfectly self-contained layer of clay. It's actually, there's many different layers of ore. These ores are, are stratified on top of each other, and there's kind of a gradient. And you can say, well, you know, maybe it's pure in the center of each of these layers, but at the, at the boundaries, right, there's a mix of material from these different ores that themselves form uh, either uh, unique materials or that get mixed into the more pure uh, middle of the lens of ore during production. Is, yeah. that, is that an appropriate summary? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and then you frequently level. see, you know, two layers, two different layers start penetrating through each other. And then you get, you know, uh, you know, like mixed color belts or speckles on the surface of, you know, certain ores. And, uh, you know, depending on the processing method, um, sometimes the speckles are desired. Sometimes they are not and consider as impurity. But, uh, you know, it's quite interesting to see um, how these layers interact with each other. And the that's, result of the interaction. That's that's an important point, right? Is that is that not purity is good, right? There, are, there's actually desirable uh, mixes, desirable blends of these ores, and there's unique formations caused by the different layering in the different areas around Yishin. Yep, I would say so. Yeah, and I think just thinking about how these tabular lenses, right, are deposited, the the actual depth that a specific layer could take up could be quite varied, and as we go lower and lower the types of weathering and pressure upon a specific vein of ore, while it might compositionally be very similar to maybe uh, a vein that you could find at a slightly lower depth, uh, or sorry, like a closer to the surface depth, because of the differences in weathering or pressure upon, you know, one specific vein, you, you could see slight nuances, right, which could lead to a lot of these subcategories that we were speaking of. Well, everyone, that's all the questions that we have for today. Thank you for joining us in this edition of Tea Technique Editorial Conversations. Please join us again for our next conversation, Developmental History of Yixing Mining, Early Mining.